The China Global South podcast is supported in part by the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg and by our subscribers. Thank you. If you'd like to subscribe for daily news and exclusive analysis about every aspect of China's engagement in Africa, Asia, and throughout the developing world, go to chinaglobalsouth.com forward slash subscribe. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China Global South podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Podcast Network. I'm Eric Olander in Ho Chi Minh City, and as always, I'm joined by China Global South's managing editor, Kobus van Staden in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, at the time of our recording, there has been dramatic protest, really extraordinary events that have been happening in China for the past 72 hours. Things that people like me who have been following China now for the past 30 years haven't seen in a generation where tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people across the country have had enough of the zero COVID lockdowns and have filled the streets to express their outrage for all sorts of different reasons. We're seeing anger over being locked up. A lot of this was sparked by a fire that occurred in western China in Urumqi, which is the capital of Xinjiang, and 10 people could not get out and perished in that fire, in part because fire trucks couldn't get there. Now, the prevailing narrative is that because of the COVID lockdown, the way that they locked and sealed in people in homes, that the firefighters couldn't get in. The video tells a slightly different story, that there were cars parked blocking the entrance of the fire trucks into the building. Then, once in the building, they encountered a lot of the covid locks and whatnot made it difficult for people to get to. Regardless, the narratives now that spread across the country are really just tremendous. And I think it's super important that we take a pause. And a lot of people are speculating on Twitter that this is another Tiananmen Square, that this is going to be in terms of a mass protest, a mass uprising. The fact is, at this point in time, Cobus, we just don't know what is happening and where this is going to go. We don't know how the government is going to respond. We don't know if they're going to use force. We don't know if they're going to do what they did in Hong Kong, where they let it go for a long time, but at the end, they started squeezing and they came down hard. We just don't know. There is so much that we don't know. It takes an enormous amount of humility to pull back and to avoid coming to conclusions. But what we do know is that something big is happening right now. You mentioned to me that you first went to China shortly after Tiananmen. And so I was wondering, just from that experience of having been there shortly after that incident, like what kind of overlaps and differences do you see at the moment? So I first went to China in December 1989, so six months after Tiananmen Square and what happened on June 4th and the massacre and the crackdown that happened on June 4th. There are some similarities in the one sense of like, Wow, this is happening across the country. In Tiananmen and in the run-up to Tiananmen, it was, and in the democracy movement back then, what was interesting was there was factory workers, students, farmers, all kind of came together. We haven't at this point seen that right now. It's very urban-led right now in these protests in China. So we've seen protests in Wuhan where COVID was first detected. We've seen it in Shanghai, Beijing, uh, Urumqi, Guangzhou and some of those others. So those are major urban areas. Have not seen it in second, third, fourth tier cities yet. As And maybe that's because the censorship is much more rigorous. So in that sense, there's some profound differences. So again, I think it's a dangerous comparison to draw. One of the similarities, though, is that in the run-up to the crackdown on June 4th, there was this sense, again, something big was happening. And I remember when the late Soviet leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, went to Beijing and you're like, wow. This was a huge event, and it was, again, this sense that something big is happening, that here are the students on the square, and at the same time, there's a Soviet leader 100 meters away. Like, you have this awe that something big is happening, but you just didn't quite know how to frame it. That, again, is how I feel like today. But one of the other key differences between 1989 and 2022, of course, is the fact that everybody on the streets of Shanghai or Rumchi or Beijing is being photographed. Without any doubt, there is a massive surveillance state, probably the world's largest surveillance apparatus that is the world's most intrusive surveillance apparatus is now in effect. And we didn't have that back in 1989. So there was no way to really record who was there and what people were doing. 
Today, that is possible. And what is so incredible, Cobus, is how we're seeing young people. And again, these videos are just incredible. And the fact that the videos are getting out also speaks to the fact that the censorship system isn't as strong or it's overwhelmed right now by the number of videos that are getting out. But they're not taking these videos down. But the fact that these young people are pulling down their masks in full knowledge that facial recognition cameras are on the streets. And that speaks to an enormous amount of bravery on my part. Yeah, it's, it's also an interesting kind of, you know, moment like to take the temperature of what the longer term social impact of this kind of all pervasive surveillance actually is. There's a lot of misinformation about what the Chinese surveillance state actually is like. You know, there's a lot of kind of false narratives around how the social credit system actually works and so on. But you know, the one thing one can say is that there is a lot of surveillance and everyone in China knows that there's a lot of surveillance, you know. So now one is moving past this uh, a situation where you know kind of where the surveillance is simply being implemented in the society and now the society has gotten used to the surveillance and is now starting to react to the surveillance and that is very interesting and i think all societies should keep a sharp eye on that actually so this question of surveillance is absolutely central to the protests and what's going on because this surveillance system is in operation right now. It is recording all of the events that are happening across all of the different cities and universities. People are aware of it, but as Cobus pointed out, there's a lot of misunderstanding about it. And for that, we are thrilled that we had the chance last week to speak with two Wall Street Journal reporters, Lisa Lin, who covers technology in Asia for the journal. She's based out of Singapore. And also Josh Chin, who's the deputy China bureau chief. He's based in Seoul. Both are longtime China correspondents. And they're the authors of a book that came out in September called Surveillance State Inside China's Quest to Launch a New Era of Social Control. It's an absolutely essential read, especially right now when you think about everything that's going on, particularly by the fact that they talk about what goes on in Xinjiang and then they highlight in Hangzhou. So the urban elites in the East and also what's going on in places like Urumqi. So very, very fitting for the current protests that are taking place in China. So let's take a listen now to our discussion with Lisa Lin and Josh Chin. Lisa Lin, Josh Chin, thank you so much for joining us on the show. It's great to have you on the program. Thanks for having us. Fantastic to be here. Thanks, Eric. Well, congratulations on the book. You guys must be exhausted now after months of being on the road and talking about it. And I've heard you on countless podcasts. It's such a fascinating topic. It's so multifaceted. We're going to take our conversation probably in a slightly different direction than many of the other discussions that you've had, in part because, Josh, you have this fantastic experience in Africa that I know a lot of our listeners are going to be interested in. But I think what we'd like to do is set the stage first in what's happening in China. And you spend a big chunk of the book talking about two areas in China in particular, Xinjiang in the far west and a city on the east coast called Hangzhou. And you're trying to kind of show how every point in between is impacted by this new surveillance system, this most comprehensive and really holistic surveillance system of anywhere else in the world. We really want to talk a little bit about what is the Chinese Communist Party trying to achieve by so closely monitoring every thought, every movement and action of its people. So Josh, let's start with you. You tell the story of just how difficult life has become for the Uyghur population in Urumqi and other parts of Xinjiang. And you profiled a man by the name of Tahir Humut. Tell us about Tahir and his family and why their story is representative of what's going on more broadly in Xinjiang. So Tahir Hamut is a Uyghur. The Uyghurs are a Turkic Muslim group from Xinjiang, which is a sort of massive region about twice the size of Texas, uh, located in the far northwestern part of China on the doorstep of Central Asia. Like Texas, it's a resource-rich area of the country and also has a bit of a rebellious history. That's in part because of the Uyghurs are Turkic Muslims, they speak a language that is distinct from Chinese and they're distinct from Chinese in other ways in terms of religious beliefs, culture. If you go to Xinjiang, to Urumqi, which is the capital where Tahir used to live, it's sort of closer to Istanbul than it is to Beijing in a lot of ways. So Tahir is regarded by some as one of the greatest living poets amongst the Uyghurs, but he's a, a really, led a really fascinating life. 
was uh, involved in the Tiananmen Square protests in 1989 when he was a college student, spent some time in a labor camp. And then uh, after getting out, he became a filmmaker and sort of rehabilitated himself and was living a, an actually fairly prosperous and peaceful life in Arumchi. And you know, things started to change a little bit for him in 2014, which is a year when the Communist Party was putting a lot of pressure on Xinjiang. The party is, you know, it's worried about Uyghurs, the sort of resistance among many Uyghurs to Communist Party rule, and also a sort of increasing influence of Islam and schools of Islam from outside of China on Uyghur identity. Uh, and, and so it's cracking down fairly hard. And in the midst of this, two groups of Uyghurs carried out attacks outside of Xinjiang, one in Beijing, one in Kunming, and that sparked an even harsher crackdown. And around that time, Tahir, he started to sort of entertain ideas of trying to get his family out. But uh, so we started to lay the groundwork and then all of it came to a head at the end of 2016 when a new Communist Party secretary was assigned to Xinjiang who was, he was kind of a real, this guy named Chen Chuenguo, who was a real ideological enforcer. He sort of specialized in snuffing out groups of people who were ideologically opposed to the Communist Party, including Falun Gong members and Tibetan Buddhists. And uh, he came in and instituted this new system. He basically built this new surveillance state in Xinjiang that turned out to be more dystopian than sort of any dystopian fiction you 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 would read. It, it was a system that you know instituted used sort of digital AI powered tracking tools to subject essentially every Uyghur uh, in the region to just suffocating almost constant surveillance everywhere they went. So this meant, you know, there were sort of facial recognition cameras scattered around the region that could identify if you were a Uyghur could identify you on the street. There were security checkpoints everywhere you wanted to go at every bank and hotel or market or bazaar where you had to scan your card and also your face to and you know just created a record of where you were going. Police could call Uyghurs over on the sidewalk and demand that they hand over their smartphones and scan their smartphones for sort of digital contraband or what the Communist Party considered to be digital contraband, which could be anything from, you know, a PDF of the Quran to an encrypted chat app. And why exactly are they doing this to this extent? For people who are not familiar with Xinjiang, what's the motivation for the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese government to be so tough specifically on Uyghurs? Right. You know, that is interesting. The Uyghurs have always sort of been generally resistant to Chinese rule and not just with the Communist Party. I mean, going back centuries to the imperial era, you know, Chinese rulers in Beijing have always coveted Xinjiang because it's resource rich, because it's strategically located, but they've always really struggled to control it. That's partly because Uyghurs and other other Turkic Muslim groups have, have just been resistant to Chinese rule. They don't really see themselves traditionally as part of China. And there was increasing friction between the Communist Party and Uyghurs in the run-up to this period where the Chinese Communist Party accused many Uyghurs of being terrorists or religious extremists. If you sort of actually kind of dig into events and kind of look at what was going on on the ground, there were, there were certainly bombings and attacks and conflicts, but in most of those cases, they were in response to sort of heavy-handed police action. So anyway, there was a, a lot of conflict between Uyghurs and the Communist Party, and the, the party's idea, what was sort of driving this new campaign that came into effect sort of the end of 2016, was an effort to use uh, these new surveillance technologies to identify, so sort of track and categorize and identify Uyghurs and sort of use the collection of that data to analyze their behavior and sort of try to predict the level of threat that they pose or might pose in the future to kind of communist party imposed order in the region, right? And so what did this look like on the ground? And so Tahir is a good example of this is, and as this campaign was rolling out in the early months of 2017, he and his wife were called into police station, their local police station. And they were told that they had to get their fingerprints taken, which was really weird because the police already had their fingerprints, but they didn't have a choice. So they had to go in. They go into this basement, which Tahir knows from a previous trip to that station to renew his passport is where police carry out out interrogations and beatings of Uyghur suspects. So they're standing in line and there's a line of Uyghurs in front of them and they finally get to the end of the line and what they realize is that this is an operation to collect biometric data from Uyghurs. And so their first station is they get their blood drawn and then they do get their fingerprints taken. And then they're handed newspapers and told to sit down in front of a microphone and read a newspaper out loud so that their voices can be recorded. And then it all sort of culminates in them sitting in front of this three-dimensional camera that creates a 3D model of their faces and heads so that their faces can be identified more easily by facial recognition cameras. So 
like a lot of other Uyghurs, they're being tracked constantly and that data is being fed into a, a sort of central repository that's analyzing them. And then Uyghurs whose data suggests that they are a threat are categorized as unsafe and they are sent into a, a sort of newly built gulag of political re-education centers where they're sub subjected basically to, to brainwashing. Lisa, the book contrasts this extremely stark kind of dystopia of Xinjiang with Hangzhou and, you know, kind of setting up some of the other kind of civilian uses that the system is also enabling. So I was wondering if you could contrast Hangzhou to Xinjiang for us, like, you know, kind of explain a little bit for those who don't know it, like what the city is like, and then also how these systems have been implemented there. Sure, yeah. We dug into Hangzhou primarily because we wanted to illustrate one of the big misperceptions of the Chinese surveillance state, you know, the misperception that digital surveillance in China was all about oppression. In China, it's really not. I mean, the oppression stuff makes the headlines, but in many of the wealthier Han Chinese cities along the coast, the same sort of camera systems and the same, you know, facial recognition, image recognition algorithms are used to help the Communist Party make life more simple and safe and frictionless, essentially to create like a techno-utopian state in China. And we chose Hangzhou basically to illustrate this point. And the reason why we chose Hangzhou, there, there were a couple of reasons. The main reason was the tech companies in Hangzhou tend to include people like Alibaba. And for your listeners who don't follow the Chinese tech companies that closely, Alibaba is one of China's largest internet giants. Uh, they, they specialize in e-commerce, but they have everything from cloud computing. In the past, they also had an arm doing mobile payments. And Hangzhou is also home to the world's two largest security camera companies, Hikvision and Dao. And uh, that means that the city government is very embracing of digital technology because it's actually seen, how, seen and benefited from the growth of such big juggernauts, uh, so to speak. So what the Hangzhou government did was they began to embrace and install tons of surveillance cameras at street intersections or the Chongguan, which would be a version of uh, Chinese police. They, they, there is no equivalent in the West for what China calls the Chengguan, but essentially they are the people who keep the streets clean of like illegal street hawkers, for example, or like big like Petty crime kind of thing, right? Exactly. And they're um, especially despised by a lot of people. Exactly. So the Chengguans, they're not full-fledged policemen, but they're in charge of making sure that shopkeepers, their wares don't spill out on the street. Um, nobody parks like a fancy Mercedes halfway across the sidewalk and then people can't. Or, or dry laundry on the sidewalk and make it difficult for passerbys to get through. So the Chengguan, the traffic police... And the police in Hangzhou have all embraced security cameras and you know, the same sort of surveillance systems that you saw in Xinjiang. But in Hangzhou, what the cameras are used for is a completely different thing. In Xinjiang, the cameras are used to identify people of interest, you know, the same sort of people that Josh described earlier. The Communist Party believes that they're potential terrorists and they're flagged. In Hangzhou, it would be the faces of fugitives that would go into, you know, the bucket of people of interest. So the camera tends to flag out people whom the police think are a menace to society, such as fugitives, or if they wanted to keep watch on criminals that had just come out from jail, you know, their faces would be in the database, or mentally ill patients that had escape from homes, for example. All the people that, you know, walking on the street, you really don't want them walking next to you. And it wasn't just that. Hangzhou is really notorious for having bad traffic. It's one of those Chinese cities where, because of city sprawl and because of development, like the human population in Hangzhou has tripled in the last 10 years. But at the same time, the road infrastructure has stayed the same and the subway system is still relatively undeveloped. And because of that, there are tons more cars on the street, and that's led to a lot of congestion. So the traffic police essentially install cameras that could monitor the number of cars on the road. And over peak hours would be allowing traffic lights to stay green for longer, for example. Or just to make sure that traffic accidents don't lead to heavy congestion on the street. These cameras can also spot a traffic accident after it happens and then flag it pretty immediately to the traffic police and first responders. So they get down to the scene, they clear off the scene and traffic goes smoothly again. So it's the little things like these that Hangzhou has done to really kind of embrace the technology and data collection and just to make the trade-off of having your data collected 
just so much more acceptable than it was in Xinjiang. And perhaps I should end off with one last example, which was really striking to me. I spoke to a guy in Hangzhou whose mother had fallen into a river on the outskirts of Hangzhou. And thankfully, a neighbor was around and fished her out, but she was still in pretty bad shape and needed to be sent to the hospital. The ambulance came, loaded her up. They needed to drain her lungs and get her to the hospital quickly. They turned on a system on the ambulance that essentially allowed the security cameras at road intersections to recognize the license plate. And as the ambulance was approaching, they kept the lights green. So it was a smooth ride from the accident venue all the way to the hospital. It's amazing. Yeah. When it comes to such life and death situations, it really kind of hits home, right? Uh, How technology can help and be beneficial if used in the right way. So that techno-utopianism you talk about, I mean, there's some merit to it. And I think, again, it does kind of play into the equation. And when I was living in Shanghai up until 2019, you know, a lot of my friends would point out, they say, what other city in the world the size of Shanghai? Can you sit on the subway with the door open and reading an iPhone or a Samsung Galaxy Note 5 or 10, a thousand dollar phone, and not have any concern whatsoever that somebody's going to take the phone out of your hand, run out of the subway and run out of the station? There's virtually no other city in the world you can do it because people know that they won't be able to get out of the station without being hit by 10, 15, 20 facial recognition cameras. So it creates a certain security and safety and confidence that you don't have to worry about the next guy as much because the cameras are enveloping everything. I also met a Muslim guy from Hui, which is in southern China, and I said, what do you think of all of this surveillance? And he was in Beijing at the time. We were in a Starbucks. And I said, do you like it or do you not like it, being especially because he's an ethnic minority? And he said, I am so happy that the CCP has put in these cameras. I said, what? Really? And he said, you know what? Because he said, without the cameras, they would slit his throat in a day. It's what keeps him alive, okay? And China, in many ways, is a low-trust society. Keeping you away from me is really a good thing. And all of this, so, and I'm not trying to justify or say the positive things, but to your point, there is a positive side that a lot of public opinion feels about this technology. And I'd like to kind of, before we dive into some of the more draconian, dystopian parts of it, maybe you could tell us a little bit about, again, why the Chinese public engages in this trade-off. Yeah, it's interesting that you bring up these examples. I mean, the Hui Muslim guy was a little bit warped, but generally when I was... Yeah, I mean, that was his take, so, you know. (laughs) When I was in um, Shanghai and really talking to friends about the surveillance system, people were generally very willing to make the trade-off because, A, they felt they saw benefits from it, and that's because of the information control that you have in China, right? State media is constantly hopping about how these surveillance systems work so smoothly. Uh, I, I remember there was, I believe it was a Jackie Chan concert in which they had nabbed like a fugitive on the run for several years because he had scanned his face going into the concert and then he was taken away. I mean, it's stories like that that kind of make people reassured that the surveillance system is working the way the Communist Party keeps saying it works. The other part of about the propaganda in China is that unless you were someone really interested in reading Western newspapers and had a VPN, like most foreign news outlets were banned or blocked in China. And the Chinese Communist Party wasn't, they weren't as espousing the narrative that we're trying to re-engineer these Uyghur Muslims and this is what we're doing to them, right? The whole Xinjiang project, so to speak, was painted as like this people's war on terror and how the Communist Party was dealing with terrorist elements in the western parts of the country. So most Chinese had really no idea what was happening in Xinjiang, not unless you really took the time to jump over the Chinese Great Firewall and then try to browse, you know, were interested enough in the subject to try try and browse, like, Western media reporting on it. If you were in China, you had absolutely no idea what was going on. So that kind of feeds into this whole system of, and the whole mindset of people thinking that the surveillance state actually is quite benevolent, as opposed to being quite sinister, as we know in Xinjiang. Josh, in relation to that context, you know, we've seen a lot of wild reporting and speculative reporting about the extent and possible future of the social credit system in China. So I was wondering if you could like give a bit of a reality check, like what is the social credit system? Like where does it stand at the moment and what kind of impact does it have on everyday life? 
Right. So the social credit system, as we discovered to our chagrin while working on this book, is the one aspect of the Chinese surveillance state that seemingly everyone has heard of. And it's also the one aspect of the Chinese surveillance state that most people misunderstand quite badly. And it's nobody's fault, or it's maybe it's the fault of us journalists for ourselves mis- misunderstanding it in the early days. But, you know, for people who need a refresher, you know, the social credit system was this sort of sensational story that came out of China in, I think, I want to say 2014 or 2015. And, you know, it was a system that the the Communist Party sort of described as a financial credit rating type system that they wanted to expand to cover everything, right? To cover all, or at least least to cover a, a very broad swath of behaviors, both by individuals and by companies and other organizations. And in the initial wave of attention, a lot of people sort of conflated this system with a similar sounding system that was being run by Alibaba, in fact, called Sesame Credit, which was attempting to assess the credit worthiness or the trustworthiness of Alibaba's customers by crunching data on their behaviors on the platform, right? So like the, you know, what sort of phone they use when they were shopping online, what hour of, of night would they shop, who were their friends, what sort of things would they buy? And so outside observers were a little bit confused, sort of conflated the government program with this Alibaba program and sort of imagined this system that was, you know, going to be run by the government to judge everyone, you know, people's lives and assign them a score, you know, sort of based on the totality of their behavior and their social relationships and finances and all of that. In reality, what the social credit system has turned out to be, and I should say that there are, there were people within the Communist Party who did have a very expansive vision of social credit and did actually imagine a system somewhat like that, right, that would judge people in that holistic way and not necessarily assign them a score, but maybe a series of scores or something like that. So, uh, but what, what actually happened in reality is that you know, the system ended up being a method for enforcing court judgments. So what happened is if, for example, you had a court judgment against you, a fine for for something, and you failed to pay that fine, the social credit system would put you on a blacklist, not just on the court's blacklist, but maybe on the airline blacklist, high-speed rail blacklist, or a hotel blacklist, so that if you were misbehaving in one area or you were acting in an untrustworthy, uncreditworthy way in one area, you'd be punished in another. And so, and that is happening. And it's mostly being used now to regulate companies, to punish companies for failing to abide by various regulatory requirements, but also, you know, individuals. I and mean, the state media for a period of time was, was kind of constantly touting how many hundreds of thousands or millions of high-speed plane and and, or high-speed rail and plane tickets have been denied to to untrustworthy people. But what we discovered actually while looking at this and and at other parts of the surveillance state in China is that it was as much about the propaganda as it was about the actual technology, the actual surveillance, right? It was what the Communist Party was seeming to do a lot of the time was to sort of present this idea of a social credit system or this idea of a system that's constantly monitoring you and judging you and threatening you with consequences for bad behavior in order for people to sort of internalize it and then behave better on their own, even without the system actually working. It's like a little bit of the panopticon that you guys write about that you never know what it's seeing and what it's not seeing. So the idea is that you always behave. And in that case, you get a better score. And if you don't behave, your score is not as good and there are consequences for it. Let's shift our attention now from China domestic to international. And you spend quite a bit of time in the book talking about how a lot of countries around the world may look at what's going on in China with some degree of disdain and disgust. But at the same time, you point out that many of these countries actually are using some of the same technology, if not made by the same companies. Uh, Let me quote from the book. As of 2019, Huawei said it had installed safe city systems in 700 cities across more than 100 countries and regions. ZTE, which is another Chinese tech company, claimed to have built similar systems in 160 cities spread across 45 countries. With the exceptions of Australia and Antarctica, every continent now sees Chinese surveillance technology aiding its police forces. That is a stunning statement. I mean, again, the fact is that as much as people in other countries may think what China's doing is excessive, these same countries seem to be employing the same technology. So, Lisa, can you tell us about the breadth of Chinese surveillance technology used around the world? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, you mentioned the number from Huawei. The number that Josh and I actually 
prefer to use, and it's from an independent study from some researchers from the University of Texas, is that these Chinese surveillance systems have been found in 80 countries across the world, and essentially in every continent except Australia and Antarctica. And not just in poor developing countries with weak governance too, right? You also talk about that they're found in the advanced economies as well, correct? That's right. So within those 80 countries, you do see like some democracies and cities and some democracies actually start to kind of buy into the idea of using like technology to enhance, you know, public safety. And to some extent, I'm kind of living in one being in Singapore. <laughs> I mean, to some extent, you are living in one. I mean, there's no, I mean, there's no ambiguity there with Singapore. Yeah, and and it's interesting that you kind of bring this up because I left China at the end of 2018 and I came back to Singapore thinking that this was the end of seeing so many security cameras on the street and cameras just watching every movement of mine. And just across the next few years, I just saw cameras starting to pop up on road intersections, in the lobbies of, you know, your xiaoqu, your kind of housing apartment blocks. And they were all like very similar to the way China was doing doing it. And it was interesting to me because in the past, you know, with Deng Deng Xiaoping in China, it used to be China always wanted to emulate what Singapore was doing. And in this case, it was a very quick reversal. Singapore was starting to adopt these China style surveillance systems in a very big way. And now when I take the subway to work, just entering the subway station and going to the gantry where you swipe your card to go in, you know, there's at least a dozen cameras just in that walk. So it was just very reminiscent of the same sort of surveillance that I saw in Shanghai and Hangzhou. I still remember when I was doing uh, some research for our book, and I was looking at Chinese companies that had exported this technology overseas. And I found a company that had Singapore as a case study. And essentially what they were doing was they were selling these night cameras, cameras with night vision that could do image and number recognition. So if your car was parked illegally on the road shoulder at night, the cameras would detect it and then snap a picture of your license plate and send it to the traffic police. So it's just like things like these that kind of made me realize this idea of this using digital technology to empower a government to deliver these city services. It's very alluring and it's not just for developing countries like in Africa, which Josh can obviously talk about in a bit. Josh, you looked at Uganda and Zambia in your fieldwork. And, you know, I think Uganda probably became the most famous example where there's, you know, very contentious election between Yoweri Museveni, the incumbent, and Bobby Wine, this kind of pop star turned politician. And uh, where it really does seem like the Museveni government was using this kind of technology to survey Bobby Wine's private conversations. I wonder if you could kind of introduce us a little bit to that situation and how it played out. Credit due to my Wall Street Journal colleagues in Africa who discovered this story. I have one colleague who's who's based in Kampala in the capital of Uganda, and he's very well sourced in the government. And he had started to hear whispers that Huawei, the big Chinese telecom equipment maker, uh, which has had a long presence in Uganda, was helping the Ugandan police spy on dissidents. And uh, he dug into it and sort of found some really compelling evidence that that was the case. And then I and another colleague went out there and, and we did some more reporting. And what, what we discovered is that, you know, you're wearing Musev and he was, he was facing this challenge. This was a few years ago from Bobby Wine, who was this kind of young upstart who had a really, you know, Yoweri Museveni has been in power for decades, right? And he's kind of, uh, and there's a feeling amongst many uh, Ugandans, especially younger Ugandans, that he's out of touch. Bobby Wine was this young pop star. He's from the ghetto in, in Kampala. He speaks the language of young people and he was gaining a lot of traction you know, sort of facing this challenge. Museveni went to the Chinese embassy uh, or, he, or he sent his security to talk to the Chinese embassy and the ambassador and see if there was help that they could get. And Huawei had actually sort of seeded this entire process earlier on when it had sort of given a free surveillance starter kit to Museveni as a gift. It was just a few cameras, but they had sort of given it to him for free to whet his appetite. And sure enough, he came back 
And the Chinese ambassador arranged for Ugandan police to travel to Beijing, where they were sort of given a demonstration in Beijing in the headquarters of the Ministry of Public Security, just off of Tiananmen Square. This is a big sprawling sort of Leninist structure. And they were shown how these how, like facial recognition cameras work, how data analysis works. And then they were taken to from there to, to Shenzhen, to, the, to Huawei's headquarters, where Huawei sort of quizzed them about their needs and, and sort of developed a bespoke surveillance solution for Uganda. And then not too long after that, Huawei won the bidding process. And I think the final cost, it was $126 million, which is not nothing in Uganda, but is actually quite reasonable as a price for a really sophisticated state surveillance system like the one they got. And then they installed that. And then there was a sort of interesting and telling a side story as they were installing the system and kind of getting it online the Ugandan police were trying to use some spyware that they had purchased from an Israeli firm to break into Bobby Wine's phone and they couldn't figure out how to do it and at one point turned to the Huawei engineers who were stationed in their headquarters, asked if they could help and the Huawei engineers turned around and took over the spyware and helped break into Bobby Wine's phone so they were able to, to sort of sniff out all of his plans. The end result of all of this is that, you know, in the latest elections in early 2021, there were sort of massive protests when Museveni tried to have Bobby Wine arrested for allegedly breaking COVID rules. Ugandan police used the Huawei system to round up hundreds of supporters uh, and arrest them, and then 70 went on to win the election. Now, to be fair, and it's my understanding both on this story that you reported and also your 2019 story that you did with Joe Parkinson and your colleague Nicholas Barrio talking about Huawei technicians helped African governments spy on political opponents, that Huawei has denied all of the allegations that it sanctioned this and that it was involved in any way in spying. Is that correct? That in, in all instances, they've denied it, correct? Well, right. They denied that their employees were involved in hacking Bobby Wine's phone. Okay. They didn't deny the sale of the surveillance system. No, yeah. but in terms of being... Com okay. And also in this 2019 story, which you reported, which got a lot of attention and really started the conversation on how these governments are using these smart city systems for sometimes nefarious purposes. And the New York Times did a great story about the same thing in Ecuador. You guys wrote from that story that there was no evidence that Huawei executives in China knew of or directed or approved the activities described. And I guess that brings up an interesting question that is, Huawei sells the technology, the Israeli company NCO sells their technology, the Americans sell technology, the marketplace for this stuff is very vast. How much responsibility does Huawei or any Chinese tech company have in terms of how people use their technology for nefarious reasons like this? Right. Well, and you could expand that out to, and I, I think you meant to, right, to, to all technology companies, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and this is not, not just the Chinese. And I think it's, it's a really good question. And it's one that, that countries, governments and, and companies around the world are wrestling with. In the Chinese context, what I think is distinct is the involvement of the Chinese government and, and also of the companies in sort of training local police, right? So they're not just selling the technology, right? They're sort of giving a roadmap for how to use it. And although Museveni said that he was buying these systems for crime fighting, which is what governments usually say when they buy these systems, it's clear that he was using them in a political way. And if you look at the documentation as Uganda and Huawei and, and China were discussing the system, it was clear that the Huawei and the Chinese government were sort of indicating that it could be used for political purposes. And they didn't come out and say it directly, but they, you know, they sort of, it's a whatever you need kind of approach. And I think if you step back a little bit, take a bit of a broader view, there's a big debate actually in sort of policy circles and amongst analysts about, you know, is China trying to spread its model around the world? Is it trying to create a bunch of little Chinas everywhere or, or make sort of the, this sort of techno authoritarian model, the new sort of dominant paradigm? And I think what's interesting when you look at, at Uganda, for example, is that it's clear that actually the Chinese model is, it's almost impossible to replicate, you know, and, and the Chinese government doesn't actually expect expect other countries to be able to replicate it. China always talks about, as much as they talk about sort of wanting to expand it, their influence, the Communist Party expanding its influence around the world, it also is constantly talking about how unique and special China is. And I think that's sort of the case in Africa. It's sort of clear in Africa, right, that a country like Uganda just doesn't have the resources, the highly skilled and trained bureaucracy, the databases, the sort of identification systems to do what China does. But it can use these systems to exercise greater control politically and socially. And I think ultimately that's what China is trying to do, right? It's trying to promote this idea that it is legitimate for governments to use these technologies to exert whatever sort of control they feel like they want to. 
You know, so I recently, you know, helped to oversee a research project in which one of the researchers was looking at safe city projects in Zambia. And one of the problems that she faced was getting actual any kind of crime data out of the Zambian government, particularly like actually anything that really showed that even if you're only looking at these systems only as in pure crime prevention terms that, you know, proving that they actually prevented any crime. And I've, I've seen also seen other research saying that both in East Africa and in South Asia, like even after they were installed frequently the cameras didn't work or they didn't have enough technicians to monitor them or they couldn't kind of you know process the data and, and so on and so on so do you have any kind of idea of how successful these systems actually are outside of china i mean that is a that is an incredibly difficult question to answer i mean even in china it's difficult to answer right because china is not transparent about crime data either and so in Africa, you know, those are real problems, right? I mean, we heard from one expert whose job was to help, was he worked as a tech consultant where he sort of helped uh, governments, including in Africa, troubleshoot various sort of traffic monitoring and other surveillance systems. And he told us about how he was in one police department in sub-Saharan Africa, sort of watching police operate the system, a camera system, where the police were using it not to spy on or monitor regular people, but each other, right? So like they were monitoring other traffic police collecting bribes and then demanding a cut of those bribes because uh, they'd seen it on camera. Right? <laughs> so, so yeah, these systems, there's a lot of ways for them to be ineffective and for them to not function the way they should. The study we mentioned earlier that Lisa mentioned earlier by the University of Texas scholar. Her name is Sheena Greetens. She did a subsequent study in which she did attempt to sort of answer this question on crime. And I can't remember exactly what her data sources were, but it was a peer-reviewed paper. And she did say that there was no evidence. She didn't find any evidence of significant reduction in crime in any of the cases where governments had bought state surveillance systems. But she had recorded you know, significant instances of political repression or increases in political repression. So it's one study, you know, so take it for what it's worth, but I, but it seems to ring true, you know, just based on you know anecdotal experience on the ground. And probably I, I just want to jump in here to add one more example. The example of Pakistan. Pakistan had bought Chinese surveillance system years ago, and and in our course of research, what we found out was the surveillance system, even though it was bought to fight crime, was also being abused by policemen. For a broader context, Pakistan is a pretty conservative uh, Muslim society. So there are norms or perceived norms in how women should be dressing and behaving in public. And all of a sudden, you know, women were getting doxxed on Twitter and social media with photos that looked like they were taken from surveillance cameras. And these women were supposedly doxxed because they weren't wearing enough or not covering their head or they were perhaps wearing something sleeveless and then it got it got a lot of attention and the belief was that policemen were basically taking these images snapping them and leaking them out onto the social media to try and name and shame these women so these systems have a high potential of being abused if not kind of handled properly and that's kind of the danger as well right with a lot of other technology I guess there's a part of this discussion that makes me a little bit uncomfortable, and not from anything that you're saying, but just the topic as a whole, because what we know from the Facebook whistleblowers is that the Myanmar government was using Facebook to facilitate genocide of the Rohingya. We know that in India, Facebook was used as well for similar nefarious means against the Muslim minority population as well. And I don't want to get into whataboutism here. That, that's not what this is about. The point I guess I'm trying to make is that part of this is just the nature of technology, that people are going to use these tools for good and, you know, for proper safe city things. And we spoke with the chief spokesperson for Huawei in Africa, and he said that, you know, in the West, people are very easy to dismiss these safe city programs because they take security for granted. But in most African major cities where security isn't taken for granted, there's a great appreciation for the, what this does. Now, again, we don't know the effectiveness of it based on the fact that they're not releasing statistics. But I do see his point there. And I guess how much of this is Chinese and how much of this is just the misuse of technology? And Lisa, I want to bring this back to you as well, because you quoted extensively in the book Shoshana Zuboff, who is the acclaimed New York University professor who wrote the fantastic book called Surveillance Capitalism, detailing how in the United States... It's not the same kind of surveillance that what you documented in China, but somewhere north of 90% of every government request that is made of Google is approved. And what 
Zuboff is talking about is that there's a lot more surveillance in the United States than people are aware of. And so them getting sanctimonious about the Chinese may not be entirely appropriate. So help us put it in context, Lisa, about what the Chinese system is in relation to others and this question of the misuse of technology, regardless of where it comes from. Sure. Yeah, I think what really makes China stand out in terms of its surveillance state is the concentration of power within one entity, that entity being like the Chinese Communist Party. In the U.S., yes, you do have many forms of data collection and many ways, you know, people, corporates, government entities, national security bureaus can collect information about you, but it's generally kind of scattered around. I would put it this way, you know, it, it, the DMV, the Department of Motor Vehicles in the U.S. has your photo ID, has your photo and has your ID together. And the national security agencies such as the FBI, um, the CIA, they might be able to tap your phones or they might be able to pull up data from companies about you. And, you know, Google, Meta, Twitter, Amazon and the other big tech titans have data about what you search for, what you buy online you know, who your friends are, who your social networks are. But these, such databases are kind of spread out. They're not clustered in one place. Whereas in China, the Chinese government's national security law essentially means that if the national security agency needs data from a Chinese tech company or data from any government unit, they can just simply go to the government unit or go to these Chinese tech companies, demand the data and on national security grounds, the Chinese companies and like the other government entity couldn't refuse. I mean, it would be illegal to refuse. So I think really what sets China apart is the ability to collect and amass all that data in one spot. Whereas in the U.S. and other developed countries, yes, they might have many ways of data collection, but it's spread out among different stakeholders, be it like the companies or, you know, police departments or the DMV, for example, or even, you know, the, the, the people who have your financial ratings and stuff. It's just all scattered around and not not in one location. So I, I think that's really kind of what makes, in, in my opinion, what makes China stand out. Uh, the ability to really amass so much information about you. And the point about technology and whether it promotes like a certain governance model, uh, you discussed it earlier. Generally, people like to say technology is neutral. It's really up to whoever uses it and how they use it. But in this case with Chinese surveillance systems, it does spread China's idea of social control. And more specifically, it spreads China's idea of data control. The idea that all data should be like no qualms at all. All data should be free, freely available to authorities to use and you know analyze as they choose. So I think that's kind of the danger of China spreading its surveillance state. It's also spreading its ideas of how to run and govern with respect to the data. Josh and Lisa also, please feel free to also weigh in. You discuss these kind of issues of surveillance and the particularly on the ground experience of being surveyed in such a radically different context, you know, from Xinjiang to the US to Uganda to Hangzhou. What did it teach you about how people think about their own privacy? That is a, a fantastic question. One of the topics on which our understanding changed the most, I think, over the course of writing this book was on privacy. And even from the very beginning, when we first started reporting on this, you know, of course, we were constantly asking Chinese people we knew or met just the same way Eric did, you know, what do you think of all this, right? How do you feel? And, and the most common response was, you haven't done anything wrong. You don't have anything to worry about. Right. And for the longest time, we sort of thought of that as a Chinese response, right? Because we were based in China and we were talking to Chinese people. And so we just like, we, you know, that's how we, we sort of, we categorize that in our minds. But then, you know, a few months into writing the book, I went to the U.S. to do um, reporting there for a chapter on state surveillance in the U.S. And then as I was coming back, I was flying back to China. I was in the airport standing in the security line and there was this couple up ahead of me and the woman was discussing a foreign media report about state surveillance in China. She's like, oh God, it sounds so scary. And the husband turned to her and he says, well, you know, if you haven't done anything wrong, you got nothing to worry about. Uh, and suddenly I was like, oh my God, this isn't a Chinese attitude. This is a human attitude, 
right? It's- well, it is, but you also pointed out in the book that there's a good chance that he was white, correct? Oh, absolutely. Because people from the dominant yeah. ethnic... Man- and straight. White and straight. So people from the dominant ethnic and, I guess, to your point, Cobus gender and the, the dominant majority class will always say that, and then, but yet minorities of any kind are the victims of this and tend to be a little bit less optimistic about it. Absolutely. Yeah. And exactly. And that was the sort of the other discoveries, the sort of related discoveries we had in this book is, you know, that that sort of state surveillance, the nature of it changes, right? So it can, it can either be dystopian or utopian, or it can be, you know, terrifying or alluring, depending on who you are, where you are, uh, how much money you have, what you believe in, right? And and one of the, you know, take Hangzhou as an example, you know, it is, it is for the vast majority of people who live there, it's a really pleasant place to be. You know, anyone who's been there can tell you it's beautiful. It's got this, this big lake in the middle of it that's just incredibly picturesque has inspired poets through the centuries and it now runs quite well and, and and is wealthy and has these great tech companies but you know it often happens that one of the ways that the, the government in Hangzhou makes life so convenient is by routinely knocking down people's apartments to build new infrastructure right and this is a common thing in China, uh, eminent domain. But, you know, in, in the U.S. and other countries, there's a whole legal process and, 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 and you get certain amounts of compensation and all of that. In China, and sort of whatever the government says goes. And often you get less money for your apartment than it's worth. And what happens to people who are in this situation is they become, what uh, in China, they become petitioners, right? A group of people who sort of, they go to Beijing and they sort of petition the central government to address their grievances. Well, petitioners are a group of people who are heavily targeted by the surveillance system, right? So you could be a wealthy person in Hangzhou who for, you know, years and years was benefiting from surveillance, was, you know, enjoying the, the efficient traffic and the convenience of being able to scan your face to pay for things and book hospital uh, visits online and all of that. And then suddenly your house is knocked down and now you're a target of the system because you're angry and you're opposed to the government. So even if you are a member of the sort of racial or economic majority, it can still turn on you. So that's, you know, that's the thing we learned. And I think, and that is universal, right? Right. And that is and is absolutely the, the case in the United States that, you know, people who are comfortable sort of tend to take privacy for granted. And I think you are going to start to see this now with Roe versus Wade being overturned. Now there are a lot of states in the U.S. that are that have banned or are moving towards banning abortion. It is possible for police in those states to go to Google with a warrant and ask for Google to hand over data on all the people in a given area who are searching for abortion drugs. Right. Or all the people who were from a certain state who might have crossed state lines to go to an abortion clinic. Those are the types of data that American police now can legally acquire about women uh, in the United States. So I think the United States is certainly going to start to confront these issues in in some pretty serious ways in in the near future. Lisa, your final thoughts. Sure. I guess on my end, on the topic of privacy, I, I just want to bring up how the coronavirus has really changed the game in China with respect to data collection, state surveillance, and just awareness of privacy in general. When COVID first hit, what happened in China was authorities made everyone download this thing called a health QR code. Essentially, it's a barcode that reflects your health risk the state telecom companies would be tracking your movements in real time. And over the last 14 days, if you had gone into a COVID hotspot or an area or a city or town that had a coronavirus outbreak, then your health code would go to red. And that would mean you couldn't leave the house, you had to stay home, you had to quarantine for 14 days. And then conversely, if your health code was green, that meant that you posed no health risk to the public and you were allowed to take subways and then go into malls and kind of move about freely. So the arrival of COVID really kind of turbocharged uh, China's surveillance state. Prior to COVID, unless you were a person of interest to the Chinese police, you wouldn't be tracked on a real-time basis. But now, like everyone in China, all 1.4 billion people are now tracked on a real-time basis with that health QR code. And I think similarly, you've seen like awareness of personal privacy evolve with the coronavirus and evolve also with the heavy-handed use of these QR codes and sometimes abuse of the QR codes. You saw in the early part of COVID, wide acceptance of this you know state intrusion on personal privacy because it kept death tolls down right as death counts were climbing in developed countries such as the US you know China beyond its first major outbreak in Wuhan had managed to keep death numbers and um, covid case numbers relatively low so the chinese essentially saw the merits of that state surveillance and they they put up 
with being tracked and they put up with like the drones that would fly around your apartment complex just making sure that nobody left the complex if they were shut in. I think what happened this year was there was because of such harsh heavy-handed measures to implement the zero COVID policies, the sudden city lockdowns, the extended surprising city lockdowns, for example, the one in Shanghai, and also the abuse of the health QR code system in a city called Zhengzhou within central China, in which the authorities tried to stop a protest by changing everyone's health code red so nobody could protest. They had to be shuttled off to quarantine hotels. Incidents like these have really kind of grated on Chinese citizens. And you're definitely seeing this awareness of what it's like to be in Xinjiang for the first time in a long time, for the first time in forever, actually, like the Chinese, an ordinary Chinese citizen understands what it's like to be monitored nonstop and to be watched nonstop. And all of a sudden, you know, these drones flying around, these robot dogs checking if you're you know, patrolling and, and checking if there's anyone on the street and barking out orders, that just isn't so acceptable anymore. So just, just to end with the thought that privacy is, you know, as a concept and, and it, it is in its awareness very malleable and it changes very quickly. And just like what we saw in China this year, it can go from acceptance of state surveillance to anger against it within a couple of months. The book is Surveillance State Inside China's Quest to Launch a New Era of Social Control. You can get it everywhere and in every format. So audiobook, Kindle, hardcover, I think a paperback is probably out or coming soon. Written by Lisa Lin, who covers Asia technology news for The Wall Street Journal, focusing mostly on China and the internet. She joins us tonight from Singapore. Also, Josh Chin, Deputy Bureau Chief Responsible for Politics and General News in The Wall Street Journal's China Bureau, based in Seoul, We thank you both for staying up so late with us to do this discussion. It was fantastic. Congratulations again on the book. Josh and Lisa, if people want to follow what you're reading and writing, Lisa, where can they find you on Twitter? You can find me on Twitter and my handle is Lisa Lin WSJ, WSJ for Wall Street Journal. Okay. And Josh, how about you? Uh, Also on Twitter at uh, Josh Chin, J-O-S-H-C-H-I-N. Okay, we'll put links to the book and also to their Twitter handles in the show notes. Lisa, Josh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It was a, it was a tremendous pleasure. Same here. Thanks a lot, Eric and Kobus. Kobus, it's hard to explain to people who haven't been in China and who are used to the internet and technology being one way. That is, you go onto the web, you go onto your phone, you get Google, you go to Facebook, you watch a YouTube It's hard to explain to people what it's like in China because they can't imagine that there's an entirely separate universe of technology. There's no Google. There's no Facebook. There's no YouTube. There's none of it. There's this parallel system where everything that you do in your life in China is tied to your phone number. And because your phone number is tied to your data, which is tied to your account, which is tied to everything else, there's this clear trail. And if you don't input your phone number, nothing else works. Okay, you can't really get around it. And it's really hard to show people and tell people just how comprehensive it is. And the Chinese in so many ways have perfected this. Now, the problem is, is that to a lot of Chinese people, again, as they talk about in the book, there are real benefits to it. There's a safety and security that comes from it, even though it's oppressive in many respects. And it's a hard thing to kind of to get your head around because if you haven't been there to experience China's technology universe, man, it is surreal. Really, it's surreal. Yeah, I mean, you know, like I I think a a lot of the power of it depends also on how uniform the society is. So not only racially, but also, for example, in terms of language. And and this is not unique to China. I think this is something that one, one would also be able to say about many other very developed um, East Asian societies, you know, kind of is that that the development is to a certain extent based on sharing a very, very similar base between citizens. And for that reason, it's you, you know, kind of as a foreigner in those societies, you frequently stand out. And in the case of China, particularly, it can be very difficult as a foreigner to get into that kind of like tech 
you know system you know like the last time i was in china i remember I, like I was, I was literally trying to find you in a station in shanghai and i had a kind of a short-term kind of phone contract which had run out and uh, it was everything was shut down you know there was no getting anywhere doing anything you know it was impossible just really tough so so you're not going to so for societies you know like in africa for example where the societies are just fundamentally not uniform you know like african states were created by outside tyrants and frequently like lines drawn right Right down the middle of communities it just it's, it's a fundamentally different kind of set of, of realities i think also in western societies where the same kind of uniformity just doesn't exist so that kind of thing throws up a whole bunch of other kind of issues you know in, in relation to how these systems work i wish we had more time to talk about this question of privacy and it's a topic that we've brought up before on the show but it's so interesting in this concept because as lisa pointed out it is a malleable concept There's a lot of fluidity in it. And I think one of the problems that people in the U.S. and Europe in particular make when they think about these issues is they think there are universal values and universal agreement on what privacy means. And here in Vietnam, I'll tell you, people don't look at privacy at all the same way that they do in the West. And let's be super clear here. Americans and Europeans have a radically different view on privacy. Europeans think we are barbarians when it comes to privacy. Okay, there's virtually no restrictions on corporate intrusion into our lives in the United States. In Europe, there are very strict guardrails on what you can and can do without data. Facebook would not exist, could not have existed and could not have been created in Europe. Impossible. Jack Ma, in fact, before he was deposed, I don't know what you want to call what happened to Jack Ma, but deleted, canceled before Jack Ma was canceled by Xi Jinping. He said something very interesting. He said, no global tech company or social media company or e-commerce company can come out of Europe because the privacy laws are too strict. Now, a lot of Europeans will say, hey, we're fine with that. A lot of Americans will be like, nah, no way. And the point that I'm trying to get here is that the difference between China, Vietnam, the US and Europe is so radical that there is no consensus on what privacy is and what it means. Yeah, I think that's true. You know, on on the other hand, I think there is also certain kind of overlaps, you know, kind of like people, you know, kind of everyone gets itchy by people being in your business, right? Kind of, so there is this kind of like intuitive understanding. That's not true, Kobus. That is so not true. That's the point, is that people here in this communal communist society here in Vietnam have been raised from the time they were one day old with people in their business their whole lives whether it's they're living in families that have three or four generations in the same house, whether it's the schools which are very intrusive in your life, whether it's the government that's very intrusive in your life. People are just accustomed to it. It's the normal. Absolutely. I think where one of the big differences come in is in one of the very interesting issues that Josh raised, which is in relation to trust between the population and the police or population and authorities. You know, so so for example, that example that he mentioned about the traffic policemen kind of checking each other for like the amount of bribes they're taking, that story chimes right across Africa and, and it chimes right into like just this very, very fundamental kind of lack of trust between the authorities and the population. You know, kind of where the default assumption is that that this kind of technology will be used for corruption rather than for any kind of like the like you know the idea that public safety is even on the table for many of these systems in in Africa is, is I think is laughable for many Africans. So in that sense, I think th- there is lies a, a really kind of stark difference for me because I think even though like this this very high levels of trust in, in the in the authorities in China, I think to a certain extent, and also to a certain extent in the United States, except for among minorities, and that kind of like stark distrust of of authority, I think. Is is general in Africa. And that then means that the way that these systems are used end up being radically different. Yeah. I have a warning for people in the US and Europe. And I remember back in, oh, it must have been out 2017, 2018, I went on a trip to Chongqing, which is out in the, I think it's the kind of southwest of China, big industrial hub in China. And I remember I was at the airport checking in and it's so, I mean, it's, I'm a tech geek and you checked in with facial recognition. So you just stand in front of a screen and goes, it goes, Eric Olander, here's your boarding pass. <laughs> it was really, I mean, I just, it was creepy AF, but it was really neat. Okay. I posted this up on Facebook. I said, wow, that was weird. And I showed it. And people on Facebook were like, that will never happen here in America. Never. We, we protect our privacy too much. Will never happen. Well, guess what? Delta is now doing it in Atlanta. And when I arrived in Washington this summer, 
I gave my passport to the customs officer, the immigration officer. He didn't even open it. Didn't even open the passport and said, welcome back, Mr. Olander. Okay. So either he's memorized every American's name or they're using facial recognition that came up on his system and that he saw me. And I guess my point here is that what we think is atrocious and outrageous today becomes normalized. And in a year or two, here we are in the United States doing many of the same technologies. Again, the databases are different. The use is different. But I'm not entirely convinced that we're as free and liberated as a lot of people would like to think. Yeah, and at the same time, it's also not, you know, like the, the the narrative that frequently comes out of Western countries is that China set up this kind of egregious kind of techno panopticon and is now exporting it everywhere. Whereas like Josh and Lisa's work show and many other researchers work show that Western companies are just as actively selling this software everywhere. Um, you know, Israeli companies, Italian companies, UK companies, they've all been implicated. You know, so it's not a situation that, oh, China is exporting authoritarianism or that that's only part of the story. Like the, you know, kind of the kind of very, very active, very, you know, kind of just force of profit and entrepreneurialism itself, you know, kind of is, is a real threat to privacy. And let's not forget Facebook. I mean, what Facebook has done to humanity, I, a book will be written one day to kind of chronicle <laughs> it, but it is, I mean, again, these tools are being used for all sorts of just horrific things. And so again, I love what Josh and Lisa did. The book is absolutely indispensable. You have to read it. And I'm not saying that just because we enjoyed it. Again, this is so important because China is exporting this technology. It's exporting the use of it. It doesn't put any guardrails on who it sells it to. So if you live in a country with less than optimal governance, there's a good chance that this technology could be used for nefarious means. It is important, though, Kobus. And remember, we talked to the guy from Huawei. Adam was his name, if I remember correctly. He gave a very robust defense of Huawei in Africa that, again, none of the things that were documented by Josh in his reporting in Uganda and Zambia were officially sanctioned by Huawei, and there is no proof of that it was. That's a really important thing to remember. And at the same time, a lot of the need for these safe cities, smart cities programs are underestimated by Western critics. I think there's something to that as well. As you live in a country right now with horrific crime, Having anything that will get people to feel more safe would be something that's welcome, no doubt, right? Yeah, but I also live in a city that's paved with security cameras everywhere in, in Johannesburg. I was walking down the street in, in, a, in a, like quite a posh suburb in Joburg, and there was literally like not only cameras, like cameras on top of cameras, but also signs saying that, that it's AI-powered surveillance you know, happening in that suburb. And does that bring you any comfort? Nope. <laughs> well, because those were private cameras, right? They weren't the state, right? In Johannesburg, it's difficult to say because there's a bleeding between the private sector and the state. We're, we're not, you know, you're not, because the state is falling down on, min, on, on many aspects of service delivery, many private companies are moving in. But, you know, kind of at the same time, it could easily also be the, the Johannesburg, you know, Metropolitan Police power you know kind of using it so it's difficult to say but you know kind of neither of the two particularly kind of inspires confidence you know i don't i don't think people really feel safer because they see the cameras around well in part because you also have a breakdown of governance that the cameras themselves are not the trick but if the cameras were tied to a competent police agency that people know was going to respond quickly to crime they might feel differently about it but you can call the police in johannesburg and they might not even come Yes, that's the, that's the other side of that story. So I guess it's all part of it. And again, it goes back to the competence of the Chinese bureaucracy combined with the technology makes it a very potent force. So let's leave the conversation there. We went a little bit longer than we normally do today just because getting these two on the show was a lot of work, but it was really worth it. I've been wanting to bring them on to have this conversation because we need to talk about it in a global context beyond just China and also to really introduce people to what's happening inside of China because, again, it is unique on the scale that they're doing this on. And if you're not familiar with what's happening in China with tech, I highly recommend that you check out this book and follow the subject as well. Also, that Shoshana Zuboff book on surveillance capitalism – must read that as well. Both of them, they pair nicely together. So we're going to leave the conversation there. Kobus and I will be back again next week with another episode of the China Global South podcast. If you love or like or find interesting 
what we talked about today, you will absolutely want to subscribe to the China Global South, and you'll get all of the news that Cobus and I and the team are putting together every single day. There's a daily brief that goes out at 6 a.m. Washington time. You get podcast transcripts. You get access to four or 5,000 articles in the archive, and it's just a fantastic way to support independent journalists all based in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. So we are really serious about coming from the Global South, about the Global South, for the Global South. So we'd love for you to find out what we're doing. Go to ChinaGlobalSouth.com slash subscribe. So we'll leave it there. Copus and I will be back again next week. Thank you so much for joining us. For Copus van Staden in Johannesburg, I'm Eric Olander in Ho Chi Minh City. We'll be back again next week. See you then. The discussion continues online. Follow the China Global South Project on Twitter at China GS Project and share your thoughts on today's show or head over to our website at ChinaGlobalSouth.com where you can subscribe to receive full access to more than 5,000 articles and podcasts. Once again, that's ChinaGlobalSouth.com. Global